He told me that Ray is a legend uh, in pulmonary hypertension, which I've since learned. So I'm going to toss it over to make a formal introduction of Ray's work by uh, Dr. Murphy. Yes, thank you very much. I'm very excited to have Dr. Benza here. And as anybody in pulmonary hypertension knows him of, as being you know, one of the pioneers of, of the way we think about prognostication and risk in our patients with pH, um, and as well as having the first and largest experience with cardiomems in, the, in, in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension, which I found really exciting. Um, and uh, so I'm very, I'm looking forward to hearing the talk today about uh, group two pulmonary hypertension, which is really a field without many, many options and, you know, uh, is one of the most common causes that we see in our clinic behind group three disease, I would say. So um, we're very excited to have you. I'm really personally very excited to hear your talk. Thank you very much for being with us, Dr. Benza. It is, uh, it's really my pleasure and, uh, and really to, to speak to uh, a group as highly as acclaimed as Montefiore is, is really my pleasure and honor. Uh, it, I would have loved to have done this face to face because many of you may not know I'm a Bronx boy, I was born and bred in the Bronx and uh, have a long history with Montefiore Hospital. My father used to be the uh, president of the board of directors there for a long time when he was uh, deputy borough president of the Bronx. So uh, uh, very excited to, to be back at home uh, lecturing, even if it's virtually. Uh, so as mentioned today, the, the topic of our conversation will be the management of group two pulmonary hypertension. Whether we can or cannot do anything about this disease will be uh, what we will uh, debate. Um, <clears throat> so this the next slide just shows the, the outline uh, which will proceed through our talk. We'll talk a little bit about the prevalence and impact of pulmonary hypertension, uh, uh, talk a little bit about classification, uh, the pathophysiology and pathology of group two pulmonary hypertension, really focusing on the three compartment nature of this disease, including uh, the pressure in the left atrium and the remodeling of the pulmonary veins and arterioles. We'll talk a little bit about management principles based on these, these three compartments. And then uh, finally talk a little bit about uh, uh, management. So let's start with prevalence uh, and impact. And really to understand what we're talking about, you have to know a little bit about the general classification of pulmonary hypertension. As many people know, we have five WHO categories for pulmonary hypertension roughly defined by mean pulmonary artery pressure greater than 25. Uh, today, what we're going to be talking about is group two pulmonary hypertension, which is due to left heart disease. And this can be from systolic dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction, valvular heart disease, or uh, congenitally acquired cardiac defects. So how common is group two pulmonary hypertension? Well, if you look in this very nice large study from Australia, 12 to 13% of people who were screened with echocardiography in the community had some element of pulmonary hypertension. And we look, when you looked at the etiology of the pulmonary hypertension, you could see that the majority of this was group two disease, around 70%. And I think that's the really first important uh, teaching concept that I wanted to impart to you, that seven out of 10 people who were referred to your clinic with pulmonary hypertension will have group one, two disease, not group one disease, not group four disease, and not group three disease, but pulmonary hypertension related to left heart disease. So really everything else is by a diagnosis of exclusion. Now, What's the impact of pulmonary hypertension in the community? As you can see from this uh, nice article that was done in Minnesota, you can see that the uh, prevalence of pulmonary hypertension in the US is roughly around 20%. And that when you have pulmonary hypertension, uh, particularly significant pulmonary hypertension, that survival associated with this is very, very poor. Well, let's talk about a little numbers now. So if up to 12% of the U.S. population greater than 65 has echo evidence of pH and pH correlates with poor survival, we have about 35 million people in the U.S. walking around with uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, about 4 million walking around with pulmonary hypertension. And if 68% of this is group two, we have about 3 million U.S. citizens with some form of group two pulmonary hypertension. That's a lot of people. Now, if we look about the uh, prevalence of pulmonary hypertension in just in those with uh, reduced or uh, preserved ejection fraction, you can see that it's also quite prevalent. 
and patients with reduced ejection fraction related heart failure, 40 to 80% of these patients will have some element of pulmonary hypertension. And if we're talking about preserved ejection fraction related heart failure, around 52% of patients will have some degree of pulmonary hypertension. So let's look at uh, some calculations again. So if there are around 3 million people in the US with heart failure re reduced ejection fraction, and 62% generally of those with PEFREF have pH, and pH again is associated with decreased survival. We have about 2 million US citizens with heart failure reduced ejection fraction that have some form of group two pulmonary hypertension that will have heightened mortality related to this disease. So this stresses the very importance of identifying this substrate of patients in our population to make sure that they are seen, evaluated, and, uh, and, and thought about for, uh, for therapy. Now we know that mortality that's associated with pulmonary hypertension in group two disease is really closely associated with the pulmonary vascular resistance. Now we can see here that there's a linear association with the wedge pressure in people with heart failure, but there's really a threshold effect for PVR in group two disease. So once you exceed the three uh, woods units of resistance, we really have a market step up in mortality with this disease. And this is something that's very important for you to watch out for, because these are the people uh, that will die on you with this disease. And also very important for risk stratification in terms of evaluating people for advanced therapies, including cardiac transplantation. <clears throat> well, if we look at the prognostic significance again of pulmonary hypertension in patients with heart failure in a number of studies, you can see that it closely uh, related to mortality in patients with heart failure. And this was really dependent upon the level of PVR. But in addition to mortality, morbidity was extremely high in patients with group two pulmonary hypertension and accounted for a sizable amount of heart failure admissions. So this is a disease that can cause a great deal of extra mortality and morbidity in the patients that we're seeing with congestive heart failure. So again, very, very important uh, to recognize. So let's talk a little bit about the classification of group two pulmonary hypertension now that we know its uh, importance in, in outcome in patients with left heart disease. This is the old classification of group two pulmonary hypertension. And you know that we had very vague terms to describe this in the past. And we would describe it either as passive pulmonary hypertension or mixed pulmonary hypertension when there was a resistance issue. Well, in 2015, we changed the nomenclature and therefore it's very important to understand the nomenclature because all the new trials looking in uh, various uh, drugs to treat this disease are gonna be randomized according to this new nomenclature. And so the new nomenclature changes passive and mixed to isolated post-capillary pulmonary hypertension or combined pre-capillary and post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. And the difference between these two is really highlighted in these soft bullets. Now, obviously both of these meet the definition of pulmonary hypertension with a mean pulmonary artery pressure greater than 25 millimeters of mercury. And both of them by virtue of having group two disease will have elevated wedge pressures. The difference is those with combined pre-capillary, post-capillary pulmonary hypertension have a resistance problem and an elevated trans pulmonary gradient. Well, we went even further to define this by adding another caricature to it called the diastolic pressure gradient. And those patients with isolated post-capillary pH have diastolic pressure gradients less than or equal to seven. And those with combined disease have diastolic pressure gradients greater than seven. And so this is how you distinguish the flavors of group two pulmonary hypertension when you take people to the cath lab. And it's important to make this distinction because these two categories have very, very distinct survival curves, which we'll go into uh, in a little bit. So when you look at the survival according to group two phenotypes, you can see that when you have some with isolated post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, their survival obviously is worse than, the, than someone who doesn't have pulmonary hypertension, but much significantly improved than patients who have group uh, one uh, pH. But when you look at the survival with those with combined pre-capillary post-capillary pH, particularly when it's fixed in nature, the survival is almost as poor as if you had isolated or idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. So this is a bad disease to diagnose in patients who have 
uh, congestive heart failure or other types of left heart disease associated with this form of, of disease. So now let's talk a little bit about the pathology and pathophysiology of the disease, because I really think this gives you a lot of insight in how we manage and monitor this disease. And again, I'm gonna stress this three component uh, model of the disease, so that you're really thinking about these various uh, compartments when you're thinking about management principles. Well, the classic mechanism of group two pulmonary hypertension really starts with the passive increase uh, in pressure that's due to a variety of things. Loss of LA compliance, which is uh, pretty popular now given the, the rise of uh, uh, atrial fibrillation ablations. It could be from diastolic pressure, as we mentioned before, pulsatile lobe by uh, wedge pressure and exercise induced MR. And what this does, uh, it results in increased left atrial pressure which then activates a number of mediators or inhibits a number of mediators in the pulmonary vasculature and creates endothelial dysfunction, which is really at the heart of group two pulmonary hypertension, particularly the combined version. And this results in arterial remodeling, uh, both in the arteries and we'll find out fairly soon in the veins themselves. And then this significant pulmonary vascular remodeling results in decreased vascular compliance, blunted responses of vasodilators, and significant right ventricular failure and eventual death. Well, here's the pathology uh, of a group two disease. And I'm showing you two panels. And one patient has idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, and the other one has combined precaprily, postcaprily group two disease. And if you look at these morphological pictures, you really can't tell the difference between these two diseases. The degree of vascular remodeling in the pulmonary arterioles is exactly the same, with massive increases in the median intima and expansion of the adventitia. And so when you look at what these are, you can tell the panel on the left is combined precapillary, postcapillary pH, and the right is idiopathic, so indistinguishable. Now, when you correlate the degree of elevation of pulmonary artery pressure and the medial thickness of, of the vessel, you can see you really start getting pretty significant vascular remodeling when the mean pulmonary artery pressure is greater than 40. That's important to remember because these are the people who are going to progress on you to the combined pre-capillary, post-capillary form if you don't do something about this. Well, what's the other component? It's not just an elevation of left atrial pressure and arterial remodeling. There is significant venous remodeling in group two pulmonary hypertension. And this is very dissimilar to the other forms of uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension that we see, including pulmonary arterial hypertension and group three pulmonary hypertension related to respiratory diseases. This venous remodeling is unique to group two disease uh, and as you can see here uh, in, this, uh, in these two panels, you can see that patients with group two pulmonary hypertension have a markedly expanded venous intima and a media which is as thick as we saw in some of the arteries we looked at earlier. So venous remodeling is often the overlooked compartment in treating group two disease and why we run into so many problems when we try to move therapy that we treat arteries with to try to treat patients with group two disease. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we get into uh, more to the conversation. And, and the reason for this is that the, the remodeling agents that we use for pulmonary arterial hypertension have no effect on the mediators that really stimulate venous remodeling, which are absolutely different. These are urokinase, metalloproteinases, uh, hepatocyte growth factor and fibroblast growth factor. None of the current drugs that we have to treat PAH are successful in mitigating these factors. And so venous mitigation and remodeling does not occur with current pulmonary arterial remodeling medications. So this is what I would call the contemporary uh, uh, phenotyping of vascular remodeling, which has replaced our classical thoughts of how this process occurs. Everyone with group two pulmonary hypertension starts out with the isolated post-capillary form in which the pressure is merely related to a passive increase in left atrial pressure reflected backward into the pulmonary circulature. There's no remodeling going on at this point. Well, then as people continue to have uncontrolled high left atrial pressures, they start developing remodeling. And it first occurs in the reactive form where you may have more arterial vasoconstriction than remodeling. And finally, if the left atrial pressure is not attenuated and not dealt with, 
these people again progress to the combined precapillary, postcapillary form in which you have prominent arterial and venous remodeling. And this is the key part of the disease that you need to pick up uh, because these are the ones that, as I mentioned earlier, have the very poor mortality associated with the disease. Well, let's talk a little bit now about management principles now that we understand the prevalence, how we're classifying it, and, uh, and a little bit about the pathophysiology, because this is what I think everyone is very interested in uh, in, uh, in modern day uh, pH therapy. So what do the guidelines say on how to treat patients with group two pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary hypertension related to left heart disease? Well, not much actually. It's optimization of the underlying condition, refer the patient to an expert pH center, and that a pH approved therapies are not re recommended for pulmonary hypertension with left heart disease. So not a lot to go on uh, here. So let's talk about how we eventually can treat this disease. So we have some hope for these people uh, and, uh, and not all hype. Well, as I mentioned, there, there are one, there's one central principle that I feel and two co-principles that are key in managing, managing this disease. And the first is the management of the left atrial pressure followed by managing the underlying substrate and then inducing vascular remodeling. And then the long-term treatment of this disease is really trying to treat each one of these layers uh, simultaneously. Because if you really focus on uh, just inducing vascular remodeling with drugs, you got a lot of bad things that happen. You reduce resistance, of course, but this also increases preload to the remodeled pulmonary veins and non-conditioned substrate which actually increases left heart failure and further increases LAP, which is a stimulus that causes this disease in the first place. This results in pulmonary, hypertension, uh, pulmonary edema, worsening pulmonary hypertension, RV ischemia, lower cardiac output and patient compromise. So indiscriminate use of PA remodeling medications for this disease have only led to poor consequences. And we'll go into that a little bit, uh, little bit later. So what do we think is a central management scheme uh, for treating this disease? One, it's, uh, it, it really depends on the type of the underlying substrate because modifying substrate is very, very important. So if you have an anatomical issue, we need to fix it. But it's a functional issue, we need to try to change that functional component. Uh, if there, and we also have to determine if the substrate itself is recoverable or not. Is it, is it fixable? Can we modify it? Uh, we then have to control aggravating factors that can make those substrate worse, including obesity, sleep apnea, and diabetes. And then we have to focus on the type of pulmonary hypertension, because the type of pulmonary hypertension really tells you what therapies you need to do to try to reverse this. If it's isolated, we need to control left atrial pressure and modify the substrate. That's all you need to do. If it's reactive, we need to control the left atrial pressure, modify the substrate again, and then maybe talk about uh, vasal remodeling therapy. But if it's combined precapillary, postcapillary, we need this combined approach, I think, to eventually treat this disease. So I call this the three-pronged treatment for treating group two pulmonary hypertension. You need to control the left atrial pressure, modify the underlying substrate, and then induce pulmonary, uh, pulmonary vascular remodeling. And when you finally get to the stage of inducing pulmonary vascular remodeling, you have to choose drugs that will both affect vascular load and affect the LV themselves. And there are some drugs that are better than others, particularly those that affect the cyclic GMP PKG axis. Uh, because they improve uh, ventricular vascular coupling. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. <clears throat> so uh, drugs that, that, uh, that belong to this category uh, obviously increase cyclic GMP and increase nitric oxide downstream. They improve coronary and systemic endothelial function. And in murine models, they have decreased level B hypertrophy in response to pressure overload, decreased fibrosis, and also improved leucotropy. So eventually these drugs that modify this signaling pathway may be the best drug to use in treating the vascular component or the arterial component of, uh, uh, of, of group two disease. So again, when we look at this three prong component, when we're talking about vascular remodeling, we have to remember we have to modify the pulmonary veins because in and of themselves, remodeling these with long-term control of the to pressure may actually do a lot in remodeling the pulmonary arterials without adding any drugs. 
But if this is not effective, this is where these drugs may be very useful. And we're gonna go and show you some examples of how this three-prong approach works. I think the best example we can give of this is in patients supported with mechanical circulatory support. Uh, and, and Uli can certainly uh, attest to some of these, uh, these observations. And patients who are supported by LVADs, who do a very good job of controlling left atrial pressure in the most part, can have important reductions in pulmonary arterial pressure just using the VAD. But this effect can be markedly augmented uh, in the long term after the left atrial pressure has be, uh, been decompressed by adding uh, a drugs like sildenafil. And these observations were also seen with drugs uh, of the endothelin antagonist category and with inhaled nitric oxide. The importance of this is that you've attained long-term left atrial decompression by the use of the mechanical circulatory uh, device before you induce the vascular remodeling uh, with these medications. So uh, let's examine the three-prong approach uh, one at a time. The first, obviously, is the management of uh, left atrial pressure. This is really the key concept that I want to drive home with everyone today. 90% of the hospitalizations that we see in heart failure result from increased hydrostatic pressure in the left atrium. And obviously, the rate of rise uh, and the rate of pulmonary edema and heightened PAP is directly related to the rapidity of the rise the duration of the rise and the magnitude of the left atrial pressure changes. And in group two pulmonary hypertension, the uh, repeated elevations uh, in left atrial pressure and the subsequent acute on chronic elevations in PAP can result in acute right heart failure and hospitalization and lead to CPCPH. So how do we manage left atrial pressure uh, uh, in the ambulatory environment? These are the medications we typically use and some of the mechanical unloading devices that we can use. Now, the problem with diuretics uh, and the problem that we'll see in many of the clinical trials uh, that we've tried to treat uh, group two pulmonary hypertension is that diuretics are not given routinely. In order to really have a great effect on this form of the disease, you have to have protocol driven frequent readjustments based on symptoms or other markers in order to keep the left atrial pressure neutral. For a mechanical unloading, these guys do this very well. And so chronic consistent unloading uh, with possible speed optimization can really do a nice job of uh, controlling the left atrial pressure. This was a nice paper uh, that was published uh, by Dan Burkhoff, uh, which showed a, an experimental observation using a left atrial pump. And you can see very clearly in this panel that in those uh, patient scenarios who received the left atrial pump resulting in significant left atrial, left atrial decompression, that these patients had significant reductions in pulmonary artery pressure. Well, obviously we don't have left, left atrial pumps right now. This is uh, uh, really highly experimental, but what we do have are uh, decompression devices for the left atrium with intraatrial shunts. And many of you can, will recognize the, the devices in these pictures as the uh, V-Wave uh, interatrial shunt device and the expanded, uh, expanded uh, IASD device. And when you can see in the prospective single arm trials uh, with this device, uh, with these devices, you, you see many favorable things. Uh, they improve NYHA class, uh, they improve six minute walk test, they improve quality of life scan, uh, uh, scans, uh, but they don't improve, uh, they also improve significantly the wedge pressure. So you can tell that they actually do a good job of decompress decompressing the left atrial pressure. They have not seen many changes in, in NT pro BMP with this. And these devices are again being used uh, in further uh, non randomized trial to see if they uh, continue to have this uh, uh, really good effect on left atrial pressure. So we don't know that these devices may eventually be a very good device to use in patients with group two pulmonary hypertension because of the degree of left atrial pressure reduction that you see with these. Well, the next major uh, portion of, of uh, controlling uh, this disease and part of the three-prong approach is, as I mentioned, managing of the underlying substrate. And you can do this in a number of ways with medications, by, again, by controlling exacerbating conditions, by fixing anatomical lesions if feasible and according to guidelines, including valvular heart disease, and again, through mechanical remodeling, uh, potentially with LVADs. Now, 
when you're using uh, medications, it's not only important to make sure you have the right medications on board, but you also have to make sure that you optimize the, the dose of these medications while you're managing the left atrial pressure, or you'll do very, very little to manage in the underlying substrate. And you can see here very clearly that by fixing the underlying substrate, in this case, a fixed anatomical defect, that you have a significant improvement in pulmonary vascular modeling. Now, how do you manage the pulmonary vascular modeling in and of itself? We talked about how you manage the left atrial pressure, how you manage an underlying substrate. Well, this is the third prong uh, of the three-prong approach. And you can see that there have been many studies evaluating pH-specific therapies in patients with, uh, with heart failure. Unfortunately, all these outcomes with these studies and using these drugs have been negative. Now, the important thing about this is that these trials failed to control for pulmonary hypertension and did not have a protocol-driven algorithm for controlling left atrial pressure. So it's not surprising that the outcome in these studies were negative. We've also had studies evaluating pH-specific therapies in patients with heart failure and with established pulmonary hypertension. Now, the re results of these studies have been fairly mixed, some with no differences, some with significant differences in uh, reductions in mean pulmonary artery pressure and pulmonary vascular resistance. Um, but these studies have really uh, failed uh, to convince us because they consisted of very few patients and many of them were single or dual center experiences. So really not quite the weight of evidence to really convince us to use these drugs uh, in this disease state. Well, we do have some now completed randomized clinical trials uh, that are examined the PD-5 and O pathway in patients with pulmonary hypertension and left heart disease. Again, a lot of these studies uh, were, were not significant and did not meet their primary endpoints. And again, these trials failed to control for volume and did not have protocol-driven algorithms for controlling left atrial pressure. So again, the, the purpose of showing you this is that if you just focus on the remodeling part of this equation and don't control left atrial pressure or try to manage the underlying substrate, you're not going to be very successful in treating these patients just with uh, pH remodeling therapies. And we have some ongoing uh, randomized clinical trials with pH-specific medications uh, in pulmonary hypertension and left heart disease. The first of these to come out was the MELODY-1 study. And the MELODY-1 study was a small study. It was only in 63 patients, but with uh, CPCPH. It was a 12-week trial, really just looking at safety and tolerability. And unfortunately, in this study, uh, there was much more fluid retention in the group that was treated with mascitentin and endothelin receptor antagonists than those who were, who were not treated. So again, a trial that, again, did not follow the three-prong approach because there were no protocol-driven uh, diuretics in this study. And again, there was no, uh, no uh, attempt to treat the underlying substrate, no modification for medications for either HEFREF or HEFPEF. So again, the veins were totally ignored uh, in, in these studies. And if you ignore the venous remodeling, you will not have an effective trial in treating group two pulmonary hypertension, particularly if it's the combined precapillary, postcapillary type. Well, we have a plethora of new drugs that are evaluating group two pulmonary hypertension uh, with a variety of pulmonary artery specific medications. These include the Serenade trial uh, with mazatentin, the Soprano trial, which is in persistent pulmonary hypertension in those with mechanical circulatory uh, support devices. The Dynamic trial, which is a trial using Rio Sequant. And then the Oral Triprosanol trial, which is a Southport trial, which was actually just uh, prematurely uh, uh, terminated, uh, the results of which we are not, uh, not aware of at this point, but are, are forthcoming. So again, to, to reiterate the management caveats for group two pulmonary hypertension is to really focus on this three-pronged treatment approach. And don't forget the veins when you're, when you're treating these people. It could, requires continuous and consistent monitoring uh, and multiple touch points with the patient and a multimodality approach in order to treat and monitor these patients simultaneously to make sure you have each compartment under control as you're trying to treat these patients. 
So how do we monitor disease? I just told you this is an important part to make sure that we're doing all the things we want to do and keeping these three compartments at bay while we're trying to make the veins and the arteries remodel. And there are many ways to monitor these people. Let's talk a little bit of how we monitor the left atrial uh, compartment. You can do this by visits to the clinic, obviously with exams, vitals, and labs. We can monitor weights. We can do neurohormonal testing like the guide, uh, the guided trial. We can use home telemonitoring. We can use and we can use implantable hemodynamic monitoring. Now the problem with this is universally uh, visits to the clinic, exams, vitals, labs, and weights suffer from poor sensitivity and discrimination and really don't help us very much in managing this disease. The neurohormonal testing trial, the guided trial, failed really to manage uh, uh, patients on an outpatient basis uh, with heart failure and pulmonary hypertension, uh, particularly in that subgroup. And home telemonitoring has been very disappointing in the clinical trials. So that leads us to really explore the use of implantable hemodynamic monitors. And I think the importance of this is to really understand where these monitors come in and how they really give us information about the left atrial pressure. As I mentioned, many of the early things that we talked about that failed to give us sensible monitoring parameters for patients with pulmonary hypertension and left heart disease, as you can see, are all very, very late signs and symptoms of congestion right near the border of decompensation and hospitalization uh, for heart failure. But when we look at uh, hemodynamic monitors, particularly in implantable hemodynamic monitors, we're getting signals very, very early in the course of this disease, which gives us a lot of lead time to try to control these and mitigate further progression. So what do we have out there to do this? We have uh, impedance monitoring, like what we get with our implantable defibrillators. And we actually had a left atrial pressure monitor itself called the heart pod that we did uh, trials with uh, uh, several years ago at St. Jude's. Obviously, when you look at thoracic impedance, you're looking at changes in uh, thoracic impedance and water content. And you can see here the importance of the change of impedance is the length a time in which impedance has changed and the height of these impedance changes. And that really gives you the threshold for identifying patients who are volume overloaded early, even before the onset of symptoms, which can really be effective in helping you manage left atrial pressure in this disease. And as you can see here, combined with just weight, that the sensitivity of these impedance monitors was superior. Well, what about modeling the underlying substrate? Well, again, we have a lot of ways to monitor this. We again have visits to the clinic, neurohormone testing, imaging, exercise testing, and repeat uh, invasive hemodynamics. Now, what about the monitoring of uh, vascular remodeling and, 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 the, and the right ventricular status? Because I really think this is where the most interest is and where all uh, the clinical trial data is, is proceeding in. Well, we again have a lot of the same things that we mentioned for monitoring the underlying substrate. Uh, but what I'd like to focus on is, uh, is, is hemodynamics. Now, the problem with these uh, classical ways of monitoring uh, pulmonary vascular remodeling is that we're limited in the number of touch points with the patients when we use these. And many of these, uh, particularly our imaging, exercise testing, testing, and invasive hemodynamics, the patient actually has to come see you in clinic. They have to undergo a test in order for you to really know where they're standing. So this is fairly impractical when you're trying to simultaneously manage three compartments and use medications to try to uh, control this very tricky disease of combined precapillary, postcapillary pulmonary hypertension. <clears throat> now, all of us are cardiologists in the audience, and I think we all love uh, doing hemodynamics. And I, I particularly like going to the cath lab to evaluate uh, our, our, our patients with pulmonary hypertension. And I really think hemodynamics are really the most important piece of pulmonary hypertension management. But as I mentioned earlier, they're not readily available. Uh, it's invasive. It can have some risk associated with it. Repeating testing is not uh, cost, uh, cost effective, and it really only gives us a single time point assessment in the sabine and resting condition. And we know our patients are not frankly in those conditions all the time. So do we have anything to replace this? And the answer is yes. We've had uh, chronic indwelling devices, 
Uh, one of them was the Chronicle device, which looked very much like a pacemaker, but instead of a pacing lead, it had a, um, a lead that was able to detect pressure in the right ventricle. And this was very effective in, in, in giving us parameters of ventricular function and, and monitoring volume and pressure in these patients. Unfortunately, uh, this device did not come to market, and so we don't have this to use clinically. But one device that we do have is, is the CardioMEMS device, and I know many of you are familiar with this device. Uh, this is a device that is placed in the pulmonary artery uh, in a over the over the wire implant. Uh, it has uh, two uh, wire loops that keeps the uh, sensor, which is shown here uh, in in this uh, 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 diagram, and it, and and firmly uh, embeds the uh, the sensor in the pulmonary artery. And with this device implanted in uh, in the left pulmonary artery, and we usually choose this device uh, this area because it's the most posteriorly directed uh, pulmonary artery. Uh, and because our, our antennas are, are, are used in uh, the back of these patients uh, to pick up signals. And what this device gives you uh, very nicely are estimates of uh, pulmonary artery systolic, uh, mean and diastolic pressure. And you can get these measurements multiple times a day in a patient who's at home, uh, either in the resting and in some cases uh, in the exercise uh, environment. And you can monitor changes in uh, pressure uh, utilizing this device over time. And you can get these area under the curve plots to show the regression of pulmonary hypertension with therapy. And we know that the use of these devices in heart failure effectively reduced heart failure hospitalization uh, and at six months uh, in the CHAMPION trial. Uh, Interestingly, uh, we have done further uh, modifications uh, of, of this device and now uh, can tell experimentally a stroke volume uh, using derivations of the PA pressure waveform. Uh, and this stroke volume we have uh, validated in our MR environments uh, at uh, my former institution and they correlate pretty well uh, with what we see as a stroke volume in MRI. So is there any signal that this technology would be useful and safe to utilize in patients with group two pulmonary hypertension? Well, I think the answer is yes. When you look at a subgroup of patients with group two pulmonary hypertension in the CHAMPION trial, you could see that there were a number of patients with elevated pulmonary vascular resistance uh, up in the range of three woods units, which as I showed you earlier, seemed to be the step off uh, for the increased in mortality and with an elevated trans pulmonary gradient uh, and diastolic pressure gradient. And when you looked at these patients uh, in, uh, in perspective of whether they were controlled using the device or not, you can see that those who had active use of the device also had improvements in cumulative hospitalizations and freedom from death and heart failure hospitalizations. And when you look at those uh, with uh, significant pulmonary hypertension, you can see that there was a good change and improvement uh, in these patients uh, utilizing this device and even in those with elevated transpulmonary gradient. So they're effective in managing patients with combined postcapillary precapillary pH. Now, this is an example of, of one of my patients uh, who we utilize this device. This is a patient who had heart failure preserved ejection fraction with very significant pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and you can see in the lower part of this panel, this patient had very severe pulmonary hypertension with a mean pulmonary artery pressure 34, systolic pressure in the upper 70s, low 80s, and a pulmonary vascular resistance of four. Again, a very high risk pulmonary vascular resistance with someone with group two pulmonary hypertension. So how do we manage this patient? Well, we use the three-prong approach. We utilize the device to really manage the underlying substrate and to improve left atrial pressure. And when we were convinced that we had effectively managed left atrial pressure and had this patient uvolemic, we added uh, a PD-5 inhibitor, in this case, sildenafil, to try to remodel the arterial component of this disease. And you can see once we did this, we had very effective reductions uh, in uh, pulmonary pressures. Now on the upper part of this panel, this blue line depicts uh, total pulmonary resistance and cardiac output, because I could tell, because as I mentioned earlier, we developed this mathematical algorithm to help us uh, depict these two parameters in patients in which we used a cardiomems device with. And you can there you see very clearly in this patient 
that when we utilize this three-prong approach, that we had reductions in to total pulmonary resistance and a, an improvement in cardiac output. And this patient did very well for a long time on this three-prong approach. This is another example in which we use this three-prong approach in a patient with, uh, who was supported by uh, intravenous inotropes and mechanical circulatory support. This was a patient with heart failure reduced ejection fraction uh, who had class four symptoms when I first met him and that we were evaluating for cardiac transplantation. Fortunately, uh, uh, he had a cardiomems device which showed us that he had very significant pulmonary hypertension and therefore was not a candidate uh, for uh, cardiac transplantation. Well, we started this person initially on uh, intravenous inotropes because his cardiac index was very low. And uh, uh, although he felt better with this, it did very, very little uh, to manage his pulmonary hypertension. Even with the optimization of his underlying substrate with diuretics, dig and aldactone, uh, we, were, had, we did uh, very little to manage uh, his pulmonary pressures. We then placed a heart made to LVAD, and you can see we had a significant drop in his pulmonary uh, artery pressures. And when we were convinced that he had significant and sustained reduction in his left atrial pressure, we again started a pH specific medication, which resulted in a significant further decline in their pulmonary pressures to a point where this patient was uh, able to go back to work as a dean. Uh, and, uh, and eventually uh, was successful in being listed for transplant. Well, if we look at some of the other parameters uh, that we uh, were able to glean from the device using knowledge of the stroke volume, you can see how this patient's systolic pulmonary artery pressure and cardiac output changed uh, with the ch various changes in implementation using this three-prong approach. And you can see after the addition of the uh, pH specific medication is where we really had significant reductions in systolic pulmonary artery pressure and elevations uh, in uh, cardiac output. But again, after a prolonged period of left atrial decompression and making sure that we continue to remodel the underlying substrate. Now, this is a little bit more complex slide where you can use derivations of the stroke volume and the pressures to give you some other useful parameters in monitoring your patients with this disease. And this shows you uh, the RV stroke work uh, in uh, red, the stroke volume index in blue, the total pulmonary resistance in black, and the cardiac efficiency in orange. Again, through the phases of the three-prong approach. And again, you can see after uh, appropriate decompensation, uh, appropriate um, decompression of the left atrial pressure with the LVAD and the addition of the pH specific remodeling medications, we had a significant improvement at stroke work index, a significant improvement in cardiac efficiency, a reduction in total pulmonary resistance, which resulted in a lot less work uh, of, uh, of, the, of the right ventricle in this case. So uh, I think uh, it's important uh, to remember uh, that when you decide to use this three-prong approach, that you're very careful in looking at the, the other drugs that you're treating heart failure with. So there are some drug-to-drug uh, some -drug interactions that you need to be aware of. So you need to be careful with that. And you have to use the three-prong approach and remember the venous remodeling. And with that, I'd like to stop uh, uh, and thank you for your attention uh, and entertain any questions. And obviously, uh, viva la Bronx. <laughs> okay, Ray, thank you so much. That was, that was really terrific. I, I really like the way you put the three compartment uh, complex there as an explanation. Um, Sandhya, uh, are you on? Can you hear us? Yeah, I'm on. Okay, very good. Why don't you uh, tee it off? I have a few questions, but they're going to be device oriented. So, and we have one device oriented question on the chat. Uh, any other comments you have in the interim? Yeah, thank you so much for that talk. It was a very interesting way of approaching. It gives us hope that there's still something we can do for our patients with this really difficult CPCH, CPH um, phenotype. My question is really just about the diastolic pressure gradient, which I think is really you know, as of late, we're paying a lot more attention to this. Does that normally, you find that it, the, the diastolic pressure gradient decreases with this therapy? And is that 
potentially a marker for this vascular coupling or remodeling, reverse remodeling that we see? Yeah, that's a really great question. As you know, the use of the diastolic pressure gradient uh, in defining group two disease is very controversial at this point. And there's been a lot of back and forth, whether this is really the marker we need to, uh, to look at when we're doing remodeling therapy in, in patients who have this disease. In my own experience and in looking at some of the data uh, uh, and some of the trials that I showed you, there is a reduction in the diastolic pressure gradient when you manage these patients correctly. And I, and I stress that latter point because in people who have had repetitive problems with recurrent pulmonary edema when using these drugs indiscriminately or without protocol driven diuretics, there's very little change that you see uh, in, uh, in these gradients or in a degree of reduction in pulmonary vascular resistance. It's only when you really have uh, the substrate and the left atrial pressure controlled that you can use this as a good marker in uh, ensuring reduction of that pre-capillary, post-capillary uh, component and the conversion back to an isolated post-capillary uh, form of the disease, which you can do and I've seen. Great. Okay, great, Ray. Um, I have questions. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the CardioMEMS device uh, that you showed uh, and its use in both heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. I'm going to tell you that we are not uh, very big users of CardioMEMS at the moment. So I'd like to see uh, what your perspective is, how early you use it, and how much you think it can be used in uh, pulmonary hypertension. You spoke to it a little bit, but what's your practice like? Well, I, I, uh, Uli, I think that if you don't have the knowledge of the stroke volume, which again is still in its uh, uh, experimental form, that the long-term uses of these devices in pulmonary hypertension have more of a limited utility. Uh, it's really that additional information and the derivations you get by adding the stroke volume component that really gives you the total data that you need to manage uh, these complicated cases. Uh, and so I think at this point in group two disease, particularly in the combined pre-capillary, post-capillary uh, form, if you don't have a lot of experience using the device, the numbers are somewhat difficult to interpret and use for a management scheme. The, the additional data really helps you significantly in determining that. And I do believe that these other parameters will eventually come out and be, uh, be available for everyday clinical use. So I think there's hope for using these devices in the future. And, and when you use them, um, how about uh, recalibration as the uh, pulmonary hypertension drugs kick in? Uh, can you still rely on the, on the PAD that the device gives you? Or what, what do you do? How often do you have to do that? So in, in the trials uh, that have looked at, in my trial in which we looked at group one disease, we had very little uh, drift uh, in, in, sensor, uh, uh, in sensor pressure recordings. We only had one, one device that needed uh, recalibration, uh, but again, that was in a cohort of only 26 patients. When you look in the large cohort of the CHAMPION trial and, and dive into the group that had a group two pulmonary hypertension, particularly the CPC form, again, there was a very low incidence of uh, sensor drift uh, and a very low incidence of sensor recalibrations. Uh, but again, that's in a highly controlled environment. And, uh, and I have heard from uh, many investigators that there has been somewhat of a variable experience uh, with sensor drift. But in my experience, it's been very little. Okay, great. So we're, we're going uh, hot on the chat now. Uh, it's a question from Azim Latip. I'm not sure if you know Azim, he's the director of uh, intervention here and does yes. a lot of uh, structural heart failure, right? I think you know him. So question number one is, um, there seem to be two ways to decompress the left atrium with iatrogenic shunts. Any thoughts about devices creating a shunt between the LA and the coronary sinus as compared to LA to RA? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I actually know such devices are actually uh, under development. Uh, I haven't gotten my hands on any and I haven't seen the data on those. So I'd be very interested in, uh, to know his experience with those if he's gotten his hand on those. The, the issue with these intraatrial shunts uh, is that they will do a nice job uh, reducing left atrial pressure, but they're also going to be increasing fl flow through the pulmonary circuit. And that's the one thing we didn't talk about earlier. So although left atrial decompression will be a good 
a good thing. They are increasing flow through arteries that are remodeled and veins that are remodeled. Right. And so again, if we're not using judicious diuretic therapy with these patients, we may still have problems uh, with uh, pulmonary edema in patients who have a lot of venous remodeling with them. Yeah, excellent. Amelia, if you can hear me, you can uh, maybe uh, unmute Azim. But in the meantime, I'm going to read a second question. He's, he's an interventionist who's really into pulmonary hypertension. Yeah? So we have started treating many patients with severe TR and group 2 uh, pH with percutaneous intervention. Many of the studies are excluding patients with PASP over 70 millimeters mercury. Is this the right measure of severity and the right cutoff? Um, let me see, I have to... Also, would it make sense to treat the pH medically first before performing the tricuspid intervention? Any data to support the effect of pH drugs on severity of TR or RV function? First in, oh yeah, the first in man was just published in the other one. So, uh, Azim, you're asking the right person because... Uh -huh. Uh, Ray is uh, on the um, eligibility committee for the triluminate study, and so is uh, Sandia, and, and so am I. So we're 75% convened here. But I'll let Ray answer that. What about uh, the cutoff of 70 millimeters mercury, and what about uh, treating uh, pulmonary hypertension first before you intervene on the tricuspid valve? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you some anecdotal data uh, on the last question first. So there is absolutely data to support the effect of pH medications on the severity of TR and RV function. So in group one disease, when all you're worrying about is the arterial component, you absolutely reduce the degree of tricuspid regurgitation, right particular remodeling with those drugs. So if you use that as um, kind of a springboard into what we see in group two pulmonary hypertension, you would think you would see the same effect if you effectively reduced pulmonary vascular resistance. So I do think that there's gonna be a problem uh, in, in trying to fix uh, these valves in patients who have fixed pulmonary vascular resistance uh, and who have the CPC uh, uh, pH uh, phenotype. And uh, there are there any very strong arguments uh, that we had when we were designing uh, studies like the triluminate studies on the degree of pulmonary hypertension that should be excluded. Uh, I, for one, was not in favor of using a pressure as a cutoff. Uh, I was more in favor of using a phenotype as a cutoff. So keeping those who had isolated post capillary pH in the trial, even if they had a higher pressure, uh, and excluding those with significant CPC pH. Because those with isolated post capillary I agree, all they needed was some time with some judicious diuretic therapy, perhaps some uh, LV remodeling therapy, and a lot of these pressures, pr patients' pressures can be reduced. And then you would have to reassess the degree of tricuspid insufficiency, because it may in fact have gotten better with some decompression. But if it remained and the pressure was at bay, these would be great patients for these uh, tricuspid interventions. However, if you have a patient with CPC pH, I think the fixing of these valves is gonna give you some problems. Uh, and, and, and we've been very, very careful uh, in uh, the triluminate study and other uh, studies evaluating the, uh, the um, correction of tricuspid insufficiency and trying to rule these patients out or try to control them before they go into these studies. Great, Sandhya, um, I know that you're doing some research uh, in this arena. Uh, are you prepared to release uh on YouTube TV, uh, a few. We are we are hopefully <laughs> gonna we are hopefully gonna show it. And basically, what we're what we're doing is basically tracking group one pure PAH patients and looking at the effects of RV remodeling and TR after a period of of pulmonary vasodilator therapy. So I imagine we're gonna show the same thing that you're you're you're, you're alluding to that there is significant improvement in, in TR, but not that is all I'm prepared to share at this moment. Yeah, I, I would concur with that. You know, in the NIH trial we did with uh, the CardioMIMS device and, uh, and, and PAH, uh, we also had uh, uh, periodic MRI evaluations of the patients that were enrolled. And in the patients whom we were able to mitigate pressure successfully with the CardioMIMS device, we had very significant improvements in right particular function. RVPA coupling and reduction of tricuspid insufficiency. So I hope you will find find the same thing when when you look at your your study.
Great. Um, Ray, uh, we didn't tell you this uh, in the beginning, but uh, this was just a test. Uh, you have now fully qualified for a full day visit to Montefiore. There we go. <laughs> and, <laughs> and come visit our pulmonary hypertension, heart failure, LVAD, and structural heart disease teams, and of course, imaging. Uh, this was terrific. Uh, Professor Ray Benza, uh, really thank you. And we look forward to an in-person visit uh, after which we can go to Roberto's. It's been my absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for inviting me uh, this afternoon. Thank Very you, Dr. Benza. Bye now. Bye. Bye-bye.